Hello friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. When you take a look at the techno union and the trade federation, it's almost a perfect allegory for the globalization that has happened in our own world in the last half century or so. As wages and living standards increased in the developed world and manufacturing jobs were offshore to developing countries and emerging markets. Every culture, every nation is on their own path of economic development and growth and reliance on low-end industries and manufacturing is just a stage that many advanced economies have to go through. In the Star's Galaxy, the offshoring occurred between the core regions of the galaxy and the outer rim after the free trade zone was established. Mega conglomerates like the Trade Federation and Techno Union would establish huge operations in the free trade areas where they had a huge advantage versus the core because of a lack of restriction on trade and business activities. It was here that companies could practice illicit business strategies like indenturing their workers by indebting them. Organizations like the Trade Federation were not only just the main employer on the planets they controlled, they were also the land lords, retailers of basic goods, and operators of all transportation and freight. These companies had basically created a feudal state. This regulation-free environment also led to the Trade Federation creating extremely cheap mass-manufactured products that vastly undercut the core world competition. These products were also generally seen as poor quality. That combined with the exploitation of their labor meant that most products that came from the Trade Federation and Techno Union and all their subsidiaries were seen in pretty poor light. This perception only got worse with the start of the Clone Wars. You had products from Techno Union subsidiary back toward industries like the B-Series Battle Droid. The mass-produced B-1 Battle Droids were not only hated and feared, but also at the same time disparaged by much of the defense industry. And as a young Star Wars fan, you buy into the fact that these Battle Droids were in fact silly and incompetent. They're basically useless bad guy cannon fodder. But as an older Star Wars fan, you start to realize that these B-1 Battle Droids, well, let's just say, they had a fair amount of advantages, especially compared to their clone counterparts. Today, we're going to go through 10 major points on why the Separatist B-1 Battle Droid was a lot better than uh, Imperial and Republic propaganda made them out to be. The Separatist Alliance was headed by a council of Outer Rim business leaders. You had the IGBC providing financing, the Techno Union and Corporate Alliance providing mining, operations, access to raw resources, processing of said resources, and heavy industrial manufacturing. And then you had the Trade Federation handling logistics. Together, what you added was an extremely sophisticated and efficient supply and manufacturing chain that could quickly be converted into a military industrial complex, which is what the Separatists did. They were able to produce battle droids in the millions, which gave them the economies of scale. The average B1 battle droid's price varied, but averaged at around just 1,800 credits per unit, which is just stupid cheap, like cheaper than the clone's main blast rifle, the DC-15A, which cost around maybe 2,200 credits, according to Republic procurement records. I can only estimate how much it costs to train a clone trooper. We might have to do a dedicated video on that later. But I'm going to guess that growing, raising, and training a clone will cost at least a million credits, if not more. So the separate destroyed army could afford to produce massive armies at just a fraction of the cost of a clone trooper. And that is exactly what they did. And you know, since there were roughly five to six million battle droids versus the clone army's 200,000 or so troops. Most of these droids were B-1 variants and they were mostly stored in Looper Hulk freighters up in orbit. They would flee the battle because Sidious obviously needed the clone army and their idiot Jedi leaders to survive a bit longer. If those droid reinforcements in orbit had landed on Geonosis, that would have probably destroyed the entire clone army, which would mean no Order 66. The clones were actually completely outnumbered. On almost every battlefield they fought on, especially in the early earlier years of the war. And high-ranking clone commanders and commandos who had access to enemy troop numbers were just confused why the Confederacy didn't just destroy their forces in one fell swoop. This shows us that Obi-Wan Kenobi accidentally stumbling upon the Geonosian planet sped up things considerably. The Grand Army of the Republic wasn't really as ready for war as Sidious wanted it to be.
Because the Separatist Alliance's economic and political goals were aligned, the construction of a massive army of droids was quite beneficial in the short term for the Confederacy of Independent Systems. It created an increased demand for raw resources, it meant more mines were open, more jobs in that sector. It also boosted work in the foundries and also in the industrial manufacturing sector and transport sector. Sure, the products being created would ultimately destroy worlds and you know, give very little in return to the taxpayers of the Separatist Alliance, but at least during the lead up of the war, it was a huge economic boon to create this army. It took the average clone trooper around nine years to go from growth tube to the battlefield, which meant that not only did it take much longer than the manufacturing of a simple droid, the Republic had to plan a decade ahead how many troops it would need for combat, which is just simply impossible to do. This might be a huge plot hole in the Clone Wars because any type of ramping up of clone production during the Clone Wars was just meaningless because the war was only like three to four years long. In comparison, a droid workshop could probably produce one B-1 battle droid every minute or every few seconds depending on the scale of the operation. So not only from a cost perspective were the clones completely unnumbered, they were also much, much slower to produce. This meant that a clone trooper had to kill tens of thousands of battle droids to even maintain some type of parity in the long run and have hope in winning the Clone Wars, which points to the artificially manufactured nature of this conflict. And while the clones individually were very well trained and far superior soldiers to the B-1 battle droids, one clone really couldn't realistically kill thousands of droids. I mean, maybe a Venator captain or a bomber pilot or Captain Rex. But for most clones, they had, you know, less impressive kill-to-death ratios. Plus, the B-1 battle droid had been in development for quite some time. The first variants we see in action were on the battlefields of Naboo more than a decade earlier. They were tested against the Gungan Grand Army, and the designers of the program learned a lot. It was here that the Trade Federation basically understood the importance of decentralizing the command structure for the droids. Having the B-1 battle droids operate with more independence was a key upgrade that made these droids far more challenging to fight. One of the more interesting design choices with the B-1 battle droid is that the Geonosians made them in their own image, but with more humanoid ergonomics. While the ultimate battle droid design might just be a sphere that floats around and has a blaster and shoots at things and is hard to hit, that would limit the capabilities of these droids significantly leading to the clones creating some kind of countermeasure. Because of the B-1 battle droid's ergonomics, however, it made them one of the more flexible battle droids in the Separatist army. They could operate all sorts of machines, ranging from the fearsome hover tank to crewing the bridge of a warship. A flexible platform like the B-1 battle droid gives you a lot of options on how you could deploy them and what kind of machines you could deploy them in. That's something that the Droidica really couldn't do, and nor could the very stiff B-2 battle droid. As you'll see during the post-war period, it was the B-2 battle droids that were relegated to hard labor, whereas the more flexible B-1 battle droids, both in programming and design, were used to manage them. One of the most brilliant things that the Sith did when they started this war was orchestrated conflict where civilians on both sides didn't have to partake. You had the clone troopers fighting for the Republic and the Separatist droid army fighting for the Confederacy. The Sith read the room well. They understood that because there had been a thousand years of peace, there was neither a culture nor stomach for warfare amongst the civilian populace. I think had Republic civilians, especially from the core regions of the galaxy, been drafted into service, the Republic would have tapped out of the conflict pretty early, seceding quite a lot of territory to the new Confederacy. At the same time, the Confederacy would have ran out of civilians pretty quickly as well. They had far less manpower than the overpopulated core regions. The point is, the less you expose your civilians to the horror of war, the longer you could carry out uh, fighting that war. And so the Confederacy using a droid army and not civilians is a huge advantage from a political standpoint. It encourages far more stability and less war fatigue amongst the civilian populace. At the same time, it frees up your commanders from a strategic and tactical point of view. No one is going to bat an eye when you send waves and waves of V1s taking heavy casualties in order to overwhelm dug-in clone troopers on Christophus or Ryloth. But if you're having the sons and daughters of Raxus going over the top and getting gunned down in the thousands, well then people are going to start questioning Count Dooku's decisions. As you'll see on almost every major battlefield of the Clone Wars, the Separatist leaders had far more flexibility when it came to using their soldiers in the field. And in a longer war of attrition, that actually does matter quite a lot. Sometimes the only option to defeating an enemy is sending your troops into the meat grinder. Even a perfectly defended position, the high ground can be overwhelmed with numbers. 
and not only did the Separatist commanders not have to worry about political blowback or losing too many soldiers, the B-1 battle droids, for the most part, were fearless. They could march headfirst into fire without disobeying orders, something that not even the clones could do. Take a look at how the 501st eventually carried out a mutiny against Pon Krell. I think they had every right to do so, of course, considering that the Jedi was a turncoat, but I can see why certain commanders wouldn't want their underlings, their soldiers, questioning any of their orders. It's a certain type of military culture that we might not see in the Republic, but existed in the CIS. This is the kind of military force where the commanders like to micromanage from the top and less autonomy is given to the individual soldiers. This might be inferior to more highly trained troops with more independence and leadership from lower ranking men and NCOs. But you know what they say about quantity having a quality of its own. And as far as the B-1 battle droids who do show fear and emotions, it's a sign of their highly complex programming and also a lack of memory wipes, which were usually done on a routine basis as part of their regularly scheduled maintenance. And here's the thing, from a morality point of view, sending droids to die in horrible, attritional battles really doesn't bother most people. I mean, you have some weirdos here and there, some misanthropes who have had bad experiences with humans, and so they empathize more with machines. But most people won't care if droids are thrown away in combat or left behind on the battlefield when there isn't enough ships to carry them or fuel. Droids were expected to fight to the death, carry out rear guard actions with no way of surviving because that is what they were programmed to do. People cared a lot more about the clone troopers even if they too were created for war because they were actual living beings. And so when Palpatine tried to decommission them, there were activists in the Senate, also amongst the civilian populace that fought for clone rights. These men were seen as heroes and protectors, which kind of limited what the central government could do to them. There's also just the moral debates about using clones without free will to go to fight a war they didn't really sign up for. So then you really don't have to worry about clankers like the B-1 battle droid. Logistics are just as important as how powerful your military is, how competent your leaders are, and how large your force is. A clone commander is extremely deadly, but he can only maybe last three days without water, maybe three weeks without food. They also needed a decent amount of space on a ship, even if they shared it for sleep and exercise. The B-1 battle droids, on the other hand, were just shut down whenever a battle was over, and neatly folded, and then put in a multi-troop transport where they were charged like iPhones. I mean, the multi-troop transport was 31 meters in length and could carry 112 B1s. An ATTE at two-thirds the size of the multi-troop transport could only carry about 28 troops. And so the separate destroyed army was quite compact. All they really needed to operate was basic logistics, like some oil and energy. This made them an extremely efficient military force with limited support personnel. When we take a look at the U.S. Army, maybe only 10% of the troops are combat-related, while the majority of the soldiers are in support or logistics positions. I mean, the Clone Army had a similar makeup. And so not only was the Grand Army of the Republic far smaller than the separate destroyed army, if you take into account just their combat specialists, they had even less troops to go around because of the heavy logistics tail that followed the clones. You guys remember that clone trooper who tried to punch the Separatist droid in the face during the Battle of Christophus? Well, that guy broke his hand on the clanker's face and then immediately after got shot. Clone troopers are definitely better soldiers, but Durasteel is definitely stronger than flesh. Clones needed a class one atmosphere to breathe. Underwater and other hazardous environments like space required additional equipment that limited their capabilities. Clones can tolerate extreme cold and heat and require special equipment. Droids have far more extreme tolerances. Droids can also easily be modified with attachments or rebuilt for different roles like the aqua droids used on Moncala. Clones would just have to wear more attachments onto their armor, which again will reduce their combat effectiveness. Ultimately, the clones were also easier to kill. Center mass shots were generally deadly. Uh, injuries to limbs could cause a trooper to bleed out. Concussion force could also kill, as could extreme gravitational force. Forces. I mean, just take a look at the difference between an LAAT and a HMP. The droid and the HMP rides on the outside of their transport while the clones ride on the inside of theirs. And so my conclusion, which I understand a lot of people are not going to like, is that the clones, despite being noble, well-trained, and just extremely likable, were an inferior military force. Because wars aren't won by individuals, but by the collective actions of an entire military force. And the separate destroyed army was just far more efficient, it was cheaper and more numerous than the JAR.
The only reason why the Grand Army of the Republic stood a chance and ultimately won the Clone Wars because that's how the Sith wanted this dramatic LARPing event to unfold. The B-1 Battle Droid was in fact the superior option during the Clone Wars in far more categories than their counterparts. So there you have it guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.